I think that what I'm chasing after is that sense of what is this, the moment? How do you measure it with a sentence? And, and one of the things that you're capturing is not just how we know the world, but also how we don't know the world. That's deeply interesting to me. I think that the dark matter that surrounds us is, is, is profoundly interesting Largely because we're so optimistically wired that we don't see it. We move through our lives in certainty. We're convinced that we're making the right choices all the time, but we're completely blind. The library was my space and there was just so much. To the Harbour Grace excursion with the voice to have a time. As a reader, um, this is such a captivating book to read. I had, going into it, I had all sorts of worries about what was going on in the world, anxieties, um, questions about what's happening south, what's happening in Ontario. Um, there's a lot of dark things we're witnessing. We're watching a, a genocide on social media, and it feels terrifying and out of control often. And um, this book, over 300 pages, helped me put that into some kind of order. Um, I think of what Flannery O'Connor said, I write to discover what I know. And with this book, I thought I'm reading to discover what I know. Um, it helped my thoughts go here. Um, and I see the world more clearly after reading it. I think that's a great gift the book can give. And it's the kind of book that will always be in me because it's changed my worldview and I'll carry it forward. Um, so it's wonderful to have Paul here tonight to talk about this. Um, can I just say that anybody who quotes Flannery O'Connor, that makes me feel very comfortable. <laughs> I know that I'm in great hands. <laughs> Luckily, I didn't go wrong in the first five minutes. Uh, okay, so we're going to talk for about 40 minutes. I'm going to ask Paul about the book specifically, um, and then he's going to do a short reading. Um, and then I'm going to talk about his writing life, ask him some questions about that and about Irish literature specifically. Um, and then the last 10 minutes, we'll have questions. So without further ado, um, okay, Paul, I actually love this book so much. I don't care that it won the Booker that much. Like, it, it sort of, it transcends that for me. But okay. I did watch your speech this morning, um, and you said this was not an easy book to write. Yeah. And so I would love to hear about that moment, which I can, having read it, I understand that. But I'd love you to talk us through the, when you first sat down to, to write, write the this book. book. Yeah. There like was, first words you were typing. Yeah, I mean, th th there's a preamble to the first few words. Okay, I want to hear it. There's a six-month preamble. Okay. Which, which is the story of writing the wrong novel. Oh. And so I was writing the wrong book for six months, and I knew it. I knew it. But every day I'd turn up, and I kept chipping away and tunneling through granite and just hitting hard rock. And what do you mean the wrong book? It felt wrong? It felt wrong because... I have, I have this, this thing that I look for as a novelist. I'm, I'm looking for a vehicle that can move like a story, but also contain my obsessions. And my obsessions are things that I'm, I want to understand. They're the things that I'm asking questions about, the things that I'm trying to unpack from the universe okay. around us. And so I'm looking for a story that has something in it that just moves of its own accord, but I know that it's going to take on a great degree of complexity. Okay. And so I had this opening sentence for, 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 for some time, and I loved it. You know, they say, murder your darling. So this opening sentence, I just loved it very dearly. And it's now buried inside this book. Um, it's hiding somewhere inside. Will you tell us what it is? I might, I might, I, I'd have to find it because okay. I, yeah, I, I'm so tired now. I can't, I can't, <laughs> I can't just pull it. Um, yeah. Um, I think I know where it is though. Well, I'll, I'll see if I can find it while, while, while I'm chatting. But um, uh, where was I? Uh, so you were writing the wrong book, and it's six. So, months. so I was. I had this. I had this sentence. And I kept coming at it, and I'd start, and I, and I had this character, and 
I was writing into a setting that was very unusual. And I, essentially what I was doing is writing something out that needed to be, to be got out of me. It was, it was not a Paul Lynch book, because all my books, if, if you know my writing, there's a consistency to what I do. At least I think there is. And mm -hmm. even though I think all the books are different, I think ultimately deep down under the hood, they're the same. They're chasing the same things. They're asking the same questions. They're, they're going after kind of these essential metaphysical questions. But this book that I was running was the wrong book. And it was a Friday. And it was the afternoon. And I just thought, stop. And, you know, come to being once advised, finish everything you start. And I thought, no, Colm, <laughs> sorry. <laughs> I'm done with this. And it, this is the thing that, that I find so fascinating as a novelist is I trusted that there was something else there. I had a sense that something just back there was lurking. And, and we do this. It's the same for you, no doubt, that you, you live right up against the subconscious as an artist, and you're tuning into that. And the door, that door to the dark, it's open sometimes, or, or it's half open, and you learn to trust that it's open. And I just had this intuition that there was something there. So I said, okay, I'm going to do nothing this weekend, nothing at all. I'm not going to stress out about the fact that I've just wasted six months of my... Because writing is expensive, right? You're sitting... It's time. Time costs money. And I thought, oh, I'm not going to worry about it. I'm going to turn up on Monday morning and see what happens. And I turned up on Monday morning. I created a new page. And I just waited. And then I wrote the opening of the book. And I wrote the first page. Close to... Almost, almost identical to how, how it is now. And it just came from back there, mm. and it had, it had, it had, it had, it had the magic, and it had the form, it had the music, it had the, the rhythm, the style, it had Eilish, or Eilish, you can call her Irish, that's okay if you want to, um, depending where you are from in Ireland. But she was literally there in the opening sentences. Really. And I and, I I knew, immediately, that I had something. It had that charge. You know, that's just that hidden charge. And, and what's interesting, I realized later on, because I did not know what I was doing. I had no, I, truly no idea what kind of book I was going to write. But I look back from now and I can see that in the opening sentences, the meaning of the book is symbolically encoded in the opening lines. And I, I just think that that's extraordinary because that, again, is a reflection of that, you know, the rational mind that we're using day to day is only one part of what we actually are. And that artists are tuning into the aspects of mind that are, that are hidden from view, but are just as powerful, just, mm -hmm. as, just as present all the time. And sometimes these, these asp this aspect of mind knows more about what you're doing than you know consciously. And I've learned this again and again and again, that I, I don't know what I'm doing, but it knows what it's doing. It knows what I'm doing. And I'm just listening and I follow. Um, and that's part of the sort of the wonder, isn't it, of writing? Um, well, I find that sentence. Let's see if I can find it. It's interesting because I went back and read the first chapter, and I was amazed at how everything's there. You know, it's one of those books, yeah. if you go back and start again, you see it. Hold on now. That's an amazing story. Sorry, I'm going to um, drag this out yeah, for a second. We'll give you asked me to do something, and I, I, I like the idea of it, but it's <laughs> like, oriented. I have to, gosh, where is it? Well, because I am curious yeah, about it. Yeah. Often a sentence is one sentence can set the whole tone. Okay. I have it. This is the secret sentence that was the, the start of the sentence. false book, right? Okay. So you have it here in Toronto. It's an exclusive. <laughs> nobody, nobody knows this. Eilish <laughs> is on the beach, and it's Christmas Day. Um, and so the, it, it's, it, it begins with this, but I'll, I'll, I'll go back to a couple of words. Watching the light upon the beach, thinking, this time of light, how the days pass by, gathering the light and releasing light into night, and we reach but cannot touch nor take what passes, what seems to pass, time's dream. Mm. I like that as an opening, right? Good sense. But it, was, <laughs> it wasn't working, sorry. <laughs> so I stuck it into the book. Just that was, that just was, to have that it. was to make me, you know, 
It make me just so I, just, I didn't want to lose that one. That's a lovely sentence. Yeah. I actually remember it struck me when I read it. So you you had this first section you'd written, um, but the book I think is so successful because of the main character. Yeah. So she came to you right away, or how consciously did you shape her? She was there. She was there right from the start, and I, I didn't quite know who she was, and I sometimes think of it as like sculpture, that, that, that she's, the shape is there, she's underneath, I just had to chip away at her. And, you know, the way that I write is close to third person most of the time, and so present tense. So that allows me to narrate a story, but it allows me to narrate a story really only from the point of view of Eilish. So the, 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 the language gets right up alongside her. So right along, we're with her. We're with her consciousness. Mm-hmm. You know, her, 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 her as as uh, the sentences literally shape themselves around her consciousness, but they also tell the story at the same time. And she just, she just, she just took hold. She just blossomed. And it seems to me that she's, she seems extraordinary to me. I mean, I felt that I, that I was in the presence of this extraordinary woman who was going to do something that was sort of impossible, you know, and she's navigating the, this labyrinth, this, this world, as you say, that's unraveling. Because it is an unraveling, you know. The book begins in, in the known world. It's Dublin. It's Dublin that seems now-ish. You know, I don't say when it is. Some people think it's set in the future. Some people think it's counterfactual. It can be both at the same time. Mm-hmm. Um, and I don't say, but yet it's a world that I recognize. It's a world that I know. It's the Dublin that I'm in all the time. And it's also the world that we all know as a liberal democracy, as this thing that we're all conditioned to believe will continue to last forever. And so this is the opening of the book. And Eilish encounters two officers from the GNSB at her front door the Garda National Services Bureau, and they're from Ireland's secret police. And Ireland does not have a secret police. And up in, in this book, they did not have it until very recently. And so what's happened is that Ireland has elected a populist government. And that government, for reasons that are not made clear, has uh, initiated emergency powers, which has given them the power to do things. That, 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 that it, it, it's, 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 it's the point at which their grip on, 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 on society changes. And so the democratic norms are beginning to slide and, and, and the media has been curbed, and, but nobody really believes that the change is occurring. I, I've noticed this myself. I watch the news and I, I'm looking at countries that I assume are just going to remain as they are. Like they're, 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 they're benchmark countries and I see something happening, a piece of legislation, and I say to myself, oh, but that's not, it's not going to be allowed to happen. It's not going to happen there. And I do it all the time. Then I catch myself and it's like, well, it is happening. Mm -hmm. It's happening now. It's unpicked as we speak. And this is the problem in, at the start of the book is that nobody quite believes it. And that, you know, the refrain, this can't be allowed to happen, is this sort of general consciousness in, of Eilish and her husband Larry. But things take a turn and the unraveling continues and Larry is disappeared. He's taken in, he works for the Teachers Union of Ireland, he's a trade unionist. And again, that's, that's, that's a strange thing because, you know, in a liberal democracy, the right to march is fundamental. This is mm-hmm. what we do, we're allowed to march. Um, and Larry's taken in and he's asked by the GNSB to prove that his behavior as the deputy leader of the TUI, as somebody who's organizing an upcoming march, is not seditious towards the state. So that's a counterintuitive thing to be, to prove. You can't prove it. Mm-hmm. Um, can't prove it you yeah. can't prove it. And so that's, that's the start of the trouble. He, um, the, the dad, yeah. Eilish's dad, says um, they're trying to change what you and I call reality. Yes. Yeah, this is... Simon is this, he's a scientist. Um, he is, he's a wonderful character. He's sliding slowly into dementia. He's elderly. But he has these moments of 
pristine lucidity. And at one point he says to Eilish, you know, he, he says, you've taken the degree. We've both taken the degree. You understand, as a scientist, what reality actually is. But they're trying to muddy reality. And, and he said, first you take charge of the institutions, and then when you take charge of the institutions, you can change the narrative. And when you take control of the narrative, then you're changing the facts, at which point you're muddying reality. And it, it, it's tapping into this post-truth world that we're in now. We're, we're seeing the same thing happening. And the book is, is holding a mirror up to that question of, well, if, if post-truth, which is <laughs> startlingly real, where might that lead us? Mm -hmm. Because if we, can't, if, 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 if we can no longer agree on what's real, if, if the consensus reality we used to, we used to have different politics, but there was a consensus about what reality actually was, and that seems to be gone now, and people literally seem to inhabit different universes. So where's that going to lead us? Um, so maybe that's one of the questions I think that's happening in this book. I think that it's um, because, well, Eilish has introduced um, the world is always ending over and over. It comes to your town, it knocks on your door. Yeah. And it's, so you, you, you start with the, you can feel the, the knuckles on the front door. And then I think it's such a, a brilliant arc for her because you slide with her. Yeah. And and as I was saying at the beginning, it's been helpful for me moving through the world. And because um, you can, after you read it, you can locate yourself where you are on her. Yeah. I mean, the, 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 one of the things I realized when I was writing this book was I wanted to understand for myself as a citizen, truly, what it means to inhabit these kind of events and unraveling. Right. What it means to live in a state that collapses. What it means to live in a democracy that ends. What it means to become stateless or placeless or homeless or all of these things, these journeys. What it means to encounter the degree of loss that Eilish encounters. And I, I realized writing this book that, that I've been living with the spectacle, as we all have, for decades, the spectacle being news. We, we've been bombarded with the spectacle on TV and we eat our dinners and this, this television is there in the corner. While, while we're chatting with our family and having our dinner, we're, we're being bombarded with the spectacle of events around the world that have, over time just become meaningless to you because you cannot truly inhabit what you see because if you did, well, we might not get out of bed in the morning. Yeah. And so, I, I was thinking about this, about how that the whisper in the ear that the novelist has has been sort of has been drowned out for a long time. This ability to 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 sort of be heard and for the novel to sort of have something to say that's not just just not just drowned out by the cacophony, the the tumult of modern life. Life is just so noisy, and and the spectacle has inured us against what we see. We have our self-defenses up all the time. And I thought, I want to write around the spectacle. I want to, I want to get the reader inside it so that their self-defenses are down and that they move, you move past the point of sympathy or feigned sympathy right. and you get to empathy. And that the book is a vehicle for this because I'm writing in the present tense. I'm writing in a way that's very mimetic. The sentences are pressing into the real. They're pressing into the moment always. And they're taking the reader through this unraveling moment by moment. So that when you come to that last line, which, you know, some of you, most of you perhaps have not, have not read it. So, but the last line is something I had to prove true. Mm. And, but when you get there, you will know for yourself what it was like. And so perhaps the next time you're in, you meet the spectacle, it will be different for you. Um, and and, and that's, it's, that's interesting for me to, to do that. It reminded me of The Handmaid's Tale in, that I've heard Mar Margaret Atwood say, everything that happened in that book has happened. Yeah. And your book felt very much Yeah, like I mean, that. I, that's so true. And I, I realized writing, when I was writing this book that, that 
I was not, you know, pe people call it dystopian, and I, I, I kind of have a problem. It's very useful to have a label. Publishers, yep. publishers need to slap a label on it, and booksellers, they, it's dystopian. It's like, ooh, that sounds nice, or scary, or whatever, and it's great. But I, I knew, I, so I knew that I would be meeting that, and then I also knew that I was exploding the form by injecting a degree of realism into it that at some point the reader would realize this is actually happening in the world right now, so it cannot be speculative. And, and, and that's the thing that, that I wanted this book to do, was to be a container for so many stories. That, 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 that there's, I really wanted to use this line from Cormac McCarthy's The Crossing as an epigraph for the book. And very sadly, we couldn't get it because he was... He was, he was very ill and he died very soon after and we were just coming up to publishing and we couldn't, we couldn't get his permission. But the line was so instructive, it was so important and um, it was so just telling of what my intention was. And the line was something like this, he says, the task of the narrator is not an easy, uh, uh, it's not an easy one. He appears to be required to choose his tale from among the many that are available. But of course that is not the case. The task is rather to make many of the one. Hmm. And that's what I wanted to do, you know, out of one, many becomes possible, that it could be a container. And so it could speak to multiple political realities all at once. And so this is the thing that I'm hearing back from readers now and people I meet, and they're saying, you know, I, I'm, I, on my travels I meet people from all over and I met somebody in London who, a Ukrainian refugee, and she said, you, you, you've told our story. And mm -hmm. the next night, I was the, it was at the South Bank Centre, and, and a, a lady from Palestine said, you, you, you're, you're, you're telling our story. And it's, that's the amazing thing for me, that I think that when you can do that, when you can get, it's the goal. It's, it's, if you can get down to a single narrative that can contain multiple narratives, you're getting closer and closer to myth. Mm. And the, cl the closer you get to myth, the more freight your story can hold. And that was my goal. That was my crazy intention, and I like that idea I, 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 of just trying to get something down to some sort of fundamental essence. Um, so it gets me out of bed. <laughs> Do you want to read now? Sure. Is it a good yeah, time? Okay, it's a good time. We have a lectern. Nice. I'll okay. I'll just read from the opening. Um, give you a f sense of what this book's about. The night has come, and she has not heard the knocking, standing at the window looking out onto the garden, how the dark gathers without sound the cherry trees. It gathers the last of the leaves, and the leaves do not resist the dark, but accept the dark in whisper. Tired now, the day almost behind her, all that still has to be done before bed, and the children settled in the living room, this feeling of rest for a moment by the glass. Watching the darkening garden and the wish to be at one with this darkness, to step outside and lie down with it, to lie with the fallen leaves and let the night pass over, to wake then with the dawn and rise renewed with the morning come, but the knocking. She hears it pass into thought, the sharp, insistent rapping, each knock possessed so fully of the knocker, she begins to frown. Then Bailey, too, is knocking on the glass door to the kitchen. He calls out to her, Ma'am, pointing to the hallway without lifting his eyes from the screen. Eilish, Eilish finds her body moving towards the hall with the baby in her arms. She opens the front door, and two men are standing before the porch glass, almost faceless in the dark. She turns on the porch light, and the men are known in an instant from how they are stood. The night cold air suspiring, it seems, as she slides open the patio door. The suburban quiet, the rain falling almost unspoken onto St. Lawrence Street, upon the black car parked in front of the house how the men seem to carry the feeling of the night. She watches them from within her own protective feeling. The young man on the left is asking if her husband is home, and there is something in the way he looks at her 
the remote yet scrutinizing eyes that make it seem as though he is trying to seize hold of something within her. In a blink, she is sought up and down the street, seeing a lone walker with a dog under an umbrella, the willows nodding to the rain, the strobings of a large TV screen in the Zajik's house across the street. She checks herself then, almost laughing, this universal reflex of guilt when the police call to your door. Ben begins to squirm in her arms and the older plainclothes man to her right is watching the child. His face seems to soften and so she addresses herself to him. She knows he too is a father. Such things are always known. That other fellow is much too young, too neat and hard-boned. She begins to speak, aware of a sudden falter in her voice. He will be home soon, in an hour or so. Would you like me to give him a ring? No, that will not be necessary, Mrs. Stack. When he comes home, could you tell him to call us at his earliest convenience? This is my card. Please call me Eilish. Is it something I can help you with? No, I'm afraid not, Mrs. Stack. This is a matter for your husband. The older plainclothes man is smiling fully at the child, and she watches for a moment the wrinkles about the mouth. It is a face put out by solemnity, the wrong face for the job. It is nothing to worry about, Mrs. Stack. Why should I be worried, Garda? Yes, indeed, Mrs. Stack. We don't want to be taking up any more of your time, and aren't we damp enough this evening making calls? It'll be hard work getting ourselves dry, but the heater in the car. She slides the patio door closed, holding the card in her hand, watching the two men return to the car, watching the car move up the street. It breaks for the junction, and its tail lights intensify, taking the look of two eyes that gleam. She looks once more onto the street returned to an evening's quiet. The heat from the hall as she steps inside and shuts the front door, and then she stands a moment examining the card and finds she has been holding her breath. This feeling now that something has come into the house. She wants to put the baby down. She wants to stand and think, seeing how it stood with the two men and came into the hallway of its own accord, something formless yet felt. She can sense it skulking alongside her. She steps through the living room past the children. Molly is holding the remote control over Bailey's head, his hands flapping in the air. He turns towards her with a pleading look. Ma'am, tell her to put my show back on. Eilish closes the kitchen door and places the child in the rocker, begins to clear from the table her laptop and diary, but stops and closes her eyes. This feeling that came into the house has followed. She looks to her phone and picks it up, her hand hesitating. She sends Larry a message, finds herself again by the window watching outside. The darkening garden, not to be wished upon now, for something of that darkness has come into the house. It was wonderful to hear that. I, I don't know, if, whoever's read the book has probably gone back into that place. <laughs> it's really something. Um, but there's such a lyrical quality to the writing. Um, and you've embedded the speech in the text, mm. which um, makes it even more propulsive. Um, I think this was in your book, or ex acceptance speech. He said, sentences should press into the unknown moment, into the most obscure, hidden aspects of life, that which is barely known. Yeah, I believe that. Very, I believe that's true. I mean, every writer has their own idea about what style should be. Every writer is chasing after something that's unique to them. For me, I think that the sentence should be a way of meeting the moment of life in its unfolding. And that's a way of encountering the full complexity of life. Mm. And so I think back to the classic past tense objective realism of Flaubert, which has been the default fiction for 
150 odd years and I love reading that but I'm, I'm not interested in writing in that sort of de detached objective past tense I think that what I'm chasing after is that sense of what is this the moment how do you measure it with a sentence and, and one of the things that you're capturing is not just how we know the world but also how we don't know the world. That's deeply interesting to me. I think that the dark matter that surrounds us is, is, is profoundly interesting, largely because we're so optimistically wired that we don't see it. We move through our lives in certainty. We're convinced that we're making the right choices all the time, but we're completely blind. And it, it was, I think both Wolf and Faulkner and maybe Faulkner borrowed it from Wolf, had the image of the match strike in the dark. And we're just holding up a little flame in this darkness. And I'm forever astounded by the truth of that. And I think that fiction should be that flame in the dark. But it should also remind us of the dark, of the truth of the dark, and what we can't know. And so there is a sort of ontological inquiry in my writing. There is this sense of Eilish in these sentences measuring what can be known, what cannot be known, how do we know the world. And this is, you know, in a certain kind of way, it goes back to the Greeks. It goes back to that idea, you know, of Oedipus, of human blindness. We don't know what's aligned, arranged behind us. The fates... I'm using the fates as a metaphor here, but mm -hmm. Gavin Corbett, the Irish writer, once said to me, he says, we write the books because we can't speak. <laughs> I, you know. It's true. That yeah. gets more pronounced, yeah. I think. <laughs> as, um, um, I, it really struck me what you were saying about your work um, before being part of a whole, because that, when I was rereading Sections of Grace, I could see almost this book in the future. You know, I could see where you were yeah. going. Yeah. Um, and I, I, Can you I, tell me where I'm going next? Yeah, I'm, exactly. I, I need some help. Because right? how much pressure is there going to be when you sit down? Oh, God. <laughs> I talked with Colin McCann about this last night. He just, he just, it's terrifying, you know, because he won the National Book Award, mm -hmm. and it's, it's how do you, how do you, you know, I trust that the, 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 this person up here, you know, that he's not the guy writing the next book. You know, the guy writing the next book is again back there under the trap door. Yeah. And and I and I trust. That I call that my back burner. The back burner. I yeah. love that. Yeah. I love it. Yeah, simmering. Yeah, yeah. I, I I stole the term from the Greeks, the daemon. Mm. You know, they called it the, the daemon was when you were channeling in channeling with the gods. But of course, you're just channeling your own subconscious. And and so, um, I think my daemon is very quiet at the moment. Yeah. He she. I think it's maybe a she actually. To be honest with you, she's she's having a long rest. Uh, and when she wakes up, I hope I'm ready. Yeah. Um, I read that your father was um, part of the Coast and Cliff Rescue Service, the yeah. Irish Coast Guard, uh, yeah. and your mom um, is an adult literacy teacher. Yeah. So if I were going to write my PhD on your work, I would start, you start with there. that. Yeah, I that. think that's a good idea. Yeah. I mean, <laughs> well, I mean, like my mother was so important. I, I, my, I have a core core early memory of sitting on the floor in Malinhead in, in North Donegal. Malinhead is the, the most northerly point of Ireland. You cannot go any further. And we were there because my father had been at sea as, uh -huh. as, a, as a radio officer in the Merchant Navy. And he came home when I was born. I think he was 27 or 28. And he took a job for the Irish Coast Guard, shipped ashore, you know, air sea rescue. He would have been organizing, organizing air sea rescue stuff. And okay. that was his job. And but so we were sitting in Malinhead in this incredibly remote place. And at the station, there was a housing at the station. I remember sitting on the floor, my mother having cut out word cards from all, an all-brand packet and just handing me the cards. And, uh, and so she was foundational, really, really important. Like the cereal box in the book. Yeah, yeah. And, and she always, was always feeding me books. And that's, an, that's, that's just great, you know. And, and at the same time, my father gave me perhaps a taste of that mythic imagination mm -hmm. that's in my books. Because when you grow up as a kid, hearing stories of this 
this annoying fellow in the house who happens to be your dad, but at the same time, he has this stack of passports back in the day, everything got stamped. And he's telling stories of his time on the Pacific, you know, stories of being in giant typhoons, like shipwreck or storms on, on massive tankers. And one, like at least once, like didn't think they, they would get through it. You know, he mm. tells a story of, he called it limping back to Tokyo with all their pumps burned out, but for one. And um, so these sort of stories, they, it gives you a sense of scale. Mm-hmm. And, and so I grew up with, with that sense of scale and I grew up with books. And I was lucky too that my uncle, my mother's brother, um, was a is is still a, a very famous writer in Ireland. His name is Jerry Stembridge, and he was a satirist, and he he uh, co-wrote along with Dermot Morgan, who was the star of Father Ted, a, a a really really seminal satirical political radio show oh. uh, in the late eighties and nineties, and so and he he directed films and he's written books so he's he's just an all-rounder unlike me i'm stuck in one my little my little track and uh but also having him as a sort of avatar you know he was in dublin i never really saw him but i knew that he was writing i knew that this he was making a living from it and so that was that's very useful to to have and i'm also very privileged to have that i recognize that a lot of people don't know anybody who's a writer and and you know that's why it's great to get into writing programs or to meet writers and and, and just to to see that writers are actually just normal people, you know, mm. sort yeah. of, sort <laughs> of, yeah. Speak for yourself. Yeah. <laughs> um, have you? Did I see that that you've joined a writing a university or you've yeah, taken I've a new just position? Yeah, I've just taken a position at Maynooth University, which is a very old university in Ireland, and they've made me distinguished writing fellow. So ah, I'll that's be, wonderful. I'll be teaching on the MA there. Um, okay. Yeah. For, that would be nice. Yeah, I, I think I actually think that I take the idea of literary citizenship very seriously. I think that it's it's important to give back because I've I've benefited so much from from the help of other people who mm-hmm. are who are above me on the journey, and I've reached a point now where I think I know something about what I'm doing, yeah, and I can communicate that effectively, and I can help people along, and and um, and I, I suppose the uh, you know. Uh, when I was telling Colin last night, I said, you know, distinguished writing fellow, he laughed, he said, extinguished writing fellow, <laughs> right? Because there's that fear that maybe yeah. you won't be, but actually the... You may have peaked. Yeah, but the commitment <laughs> is, 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 it's not, it's not crazy. It's, it's yeah. the right amount for, for, for me to be able to, I hope to continue what I'm doing. So once the Booker madness ends, and I'm not sure that it ends, but in theory it should end and I should get back to work. Though I was, I was in Jaipur and... I just checked into my hotel, and I walked out. I walked out the door, and there's this nice grove, a pass, and a grove, and there's nobody around. And this fellow emerges, and he's walking towards me, and I'm going, he's walking. It's Damon Galgut, and I says, "What the hell is this place, Booker Alley?" <laughs> <laughs> and we started talking, and he just had this thousand-yard stare. I mean, he he won the Booker three years ago, I think. Oh, and he's still. And and he's he's like he's still. And he can't get out of it. He's like, <laughs> you know, there's a reason why Kazu Ichiguro wrote The Unconsoled, this book about a musician who's no longer able to play music in a dream, trapped in this crazy dream. And he wrote that one after the booker. So, <laughs> right? <laughs> are you getting a ch- any chance to read at the moment? Are you reading anything good? Um, I'm trying to read, but it's, it's uh, you know, I, um, travel is really hard, actually. It's, yeah. It, 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 the jet lag fries me. All the, the the meeting readers is marvelous, but it's really tiring. I'm an introvert. I know you see me very talky, but I'm I'm actually quite a quiet person, and I find it really draining. And so I had this big selection of 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 of, um, of books with me, but I'm not reading a whole lot. Mm-hmm. And um, the I'm reading um, uh, Louise Gluck at the moment, and just these little. It's perfect. It's just perfect. I just go in and I go out, and she's she's it's it's. It's the mother love there. Yeah. It really is. That's she's, the way to do it. She's just extraordinary. 